Hello, my name is Sebastian von Einsiedel. I am the director of the Center for Policy Research here at UN University in Tokyo. It's my great pleasure to welcome Melissa Hathaway, a leading cybersecurity scholar who will join us here for a conversation on the future of cybersecurity. Uh, Melissa Hathaway is particularly well placed to enlighten us on the issue. She is a senior scholar at Harvard University's Belfer Center. Uh, she has served as senior advisors to both Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Um, and uh, she is uh, widely known on, on these issues. Melissa, uh, welcome at UNU. Sebastian, thank you very much. Excellent. Melissa, let's get right at the heart of it. Um, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, in his recent speech to the UN General Assembly just a couple of weeks ago, warned world leaders that cyber war has the potential, and I quote, to destroy some of the structures and systems of modern life. Meanwhile, Thomas Reed, a leading cybersecurity scholar, has recently published a book that was entitled Cyber War Will Not Take Place. Um, how worried do we need to be about a cyber 9-11, a cyber Armageddon, and what do you see as the major cybersecurity threats? Well, thank you. That's, uh, I actually, his speech, uh, the Secretary General talked about the dark side of innovation and, um, and how do we start to think about the dark side of innovation. And you have to start to think about it in terms of who wants to use the innovation in unexpected ways. And you see people, um, activists, political activists, and um, who are using the internet in unexpected ways to, um, to protest government capabilities or protest corporations' um, involvement in particular issues. Uh, you're seeing crime um, conducted over and through the internet where I can monetize your personal information. Um, you're seeing espionage and industrial espionage where uh, weaknesses in your corporate uh, enterprise, I can break in and steal your information, illegally copy it and post it on the internet or give it to my corporations to advance their own research and development. And then you're seeing uh, increased disruption of service and destruction of property. So when uh, uh, the Secretary General talks about this as, um, you know, we're on the brink of war, I think we are actually seeing many battles in the, in, uh, over and through the internet whether it's activism, crime, uh, disruption of service, and destruction of property. And there were two recent events that occurred in um, May and June of this year in 2017. May, there was a virus that broke out, actually ransomware, uh, called WannaCry, that affected more than 100 countries, disrupted services in hospitals and transportation systems, but it was, a, it was merely a disruption of information and disruption of critical services within countries. And then one month later, we saw a destructive virus that actually was, it was called NotPetya, was uh, masqueraded as a ransomware, but then actually as it, as it embedded within corporate environments, it moved for around the world within minutes, destroying key property. And if you start to think about that impacting critical infrastructure services, water, transportation, electric power, or other things that enable and empower our, all of our countries, it can in fact lead to war. I will come back to the issue of critical infrastructure in a moment, but before I do so, I wanna ask you, uh, an increasing number of observers um, argue that what we're witnessing is a growing arms race mm. in cyberspace among developed nations. What is driving um, so many countries to invest so heavily in offensive cyber capabilities? Well, I think that some um, countries believe that uh, the best defense is a strong offense. And by having the weapon or the capability, it's a deterrent from use of the weapon or capability. But I think it's also being driven by fear. Many countries recognize that they're vulnerable and exposed um, across much of their critical infrastructures and services. And so they feel that there's a real threat to their economic and political uh, stability. So again, they're developing weapons um, for, uh, for, again, as a deterrent factor. 
Uh, and I, I, there are more than 100 countries that are developing these um, offensive cyber capabilities and using them um, against other countries or against in, in uh, what I would consider these small battles that could lead to bigger, bigger problems for all of us. Now, um, to what degree do you think this arms race has been fueled by the revelations um, around Snowden as well as the allegations surrounding the, the Stuxnet, uh, Stuxnet attack, which is the malware that's believed to have been created by the US and Israel and inserted right. into um, an Iranian nuclear plant halting that, that plant, um, and a gro that leading to a growing perception that it's the US that's driving militarization of cyberspace. So I think that um, chronologically, let's just talk about Stuxnet first. Stuxnet uh, was a 2010 event and um, it was a military grade weapon that was used against, um, to halt the Iran's ability to uh, advance its nuclear program and create a nuclear weapon. And what happened was, is we had this, uh, the um, use of it and uh, the vulnerability that was exploited was widely studied around the world and was published on Wikipedia. And, um, and that, uh, whether that was, um, you know, McAfee published a report, F-Secure, um, uh, Kaspersky, and com Symantec, Symantec, I mean, com companies all around the world, mm -hmm. the security companies published, here's what was exploited, here's what, how it happened, etc. And then what happened from there is, is you started to see what I consider the sons and daughters of Stuxnet were born. And you had this proliferation of weapons, and they were called Dooku and Gauss and Flame and the Wiper Virus and Shamoon and crazy names, but they're all being used now against corporations and against countries. Um, so you could almost say that the security community, because of their transparency and the innovation of Wikipedia, allowed for the widespread understanding of how to create a weapon use a weapon and deploy the weapon um, against others. I, I think then as you start to look at the Snowden revelations and you understood what countries were capable of and doing to map the uh, vulnerabilities around the world, um, you started to see, again, fear of um, what the art of the possible was now that you had a widely proliferated weapon space and now you're starting to see that used against companies and countries all around the world. Great, Melissa, thanks. Um, you've uh, emphasized uh, in response to my first question how concerned you are about the threats to critical infrastructure and you've written quite a bit about it. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe you can elaborate a little bit on the nature of the threat um, and why governments should take that more seriously. So I, I, it's true, I wrote a, um, an opinion piece in November of last year, right as uh, President Trump uh, had assumed office. And I'm very worried about the critical infrastructures. I, and many of our countries have defined too many critical infrastructures. And when there's so many, you don't focus on the, the higher priorities. So the first is, I think, I'm very worried about um, the threat to our electric grid and um, our power supplies. And uh, my, under, my, uh, my worry about this has grown over time, but certainly when you saw the, um, the, uh, the attacks against Ukraine's power grid in both December of 2015 and then again in 20, 2016 in December in the dead of winter in Ukraine, a vulnerability was exploited um, against multiple um, power uh, centers and it knocked their power offline. Well, when you knock power offline and you knock all businesses offline because all things are powered and, um, and when you start to do this in the dead of winter or in the heat of summer, it has other consequences. Um, pipes freeze, other things break and it takes longer to repair. The second critical service that I'm very worried about is the telecommunication system. Because without power or without telecommunications, there's no free flow of goods, services, and data and capital across borders. It's what powers the world, the internet, really, at this point, because everything's digital. 
And we're starting to see more and more destructive um, attacks and or operations against our telecommunications providers. That's knocking them offline, damaging equipment, and then therefore knocking other businesses offline. We had an event in the United States just a few months ago that knocked off our, one of our major, major internet uh, service providers for four to eight hours and it knocked more than 50 businesses offline. And it was estimated cost of $22,000 per minute per business of, of, right, of exactly, of loss of business for not having internet service. Wow. Can you imagine of not having internet service for all of your businesses um, over time? And then finally, I'm very concerned about the, the weaknesses that are being exploited in our financial services system. There's a the interbanking transfer um, uh, capability of SWIFT, which is what moves money between Japan and the United States, for example, has uh, some weaknesses in its software that's been exploited. And you may have read about the, um, uh, the Bangladesh bank of losing $81, 81 million. million dollars. Yeah. Well, it turns out that there have been banks, almost 25% of the banks globally have been targeted. Not everybody's lost money, but many have. And it's our responsibility as governments and as corporations to ensure the financial integrity of the systems um, so that we can continue to have uh, prosperity and a global economy that is working together. We've already seen what it means to have a financial crisis. We don't need one that's caused through cyber insecurity. Yeah. And the fact that it was only 81 million was because of some spelling error mistake, <laughs> mistake of the people who were carrying out this heist. That's right. Um, let me bring in uh, the UN for a moment. Uh, around a couple of years ago, a group of 20 key uh, UN member states uh, in the context of the UN General Assembly in a group called the Governmental Group of Experts uh, managed to agree on a set of norms meant to govern responsible behavior in cyberspace. Now, what do you think is the promise of this effort in reducing ICT misuse um, targeted against critical infrastructure? So the 2015 agreement within the United Nations Government Group of Experts was really a very important uh, milestone for many of our countries. And then it was endorsed and um, the, the agreements that were made was endorsed or in the UN General Assembly that same year. Uh, the agreement was about, I will not misuse information communications technology, me as my country, against you as your country. Um, and uh, against your critical services and infra infrastructure services, your citizen-facing services, uh, meaning power and telecommunications and financial services and those things. They were not spelled out in that agreement, but that was what was meant. The second part of the agreement um, was that I will not allow my country to be used as a conduit for misuse of information communications technology. Uh, and that I will do everything I can not to harbor those types of illegal activities within my country, similar to how we think about it for terrorism. Um, and uh, so this was a, an important agreement, but the, the challenge is though, is that despite the agreement and the General Assembly endorsement, we're still seeing a lot of misuse of information communications technologies of country versus country and country versus company as a proxy target and that's a problem for us and even worse is that our countries who signed or uh, agreed to this um, uh, voluntary normative behavior are not talking about the misuse of information communications technology of country versus country or country versus company and if we're not going to call out the bad behavior or we're not going to self-restrain from bad behavior it then leads to a new customary norm of really anything goes. And that's not a good place for us in an institution of the United Nations who's seeking for peace, security, and stability around the world. Now, in the views of some, progress on norms on cybersecurity and cooperation around them is hobbled by an increasingly contentious debate around cyber governance, basically the question on who is the rule maker right. in cyberspace. 
and the US, um, which has uh, created the internet and has dominated it uh, for a long time, and the view of many still dominates it, the US dominance is increasingly being challenged by other countries mm -hmm. in that cyber governance debate. The Global South is complaining that US, govern, uh, US dominance is uh, deepening the digital divide, holding back their development. The Europeans claim the US is driving weaponization of uh, cyberspace. The uh, Russians, Chinese, and others are increasingly insisting on national control over cyberspace. Do we need cyber, uh, cyber governance reform before we can make any progress on, on these cybersecurity issues? Well, I think that um, we need to decide what it is that we want to govern. Um, are we governing um, the, the data? Are we governing um, how we use the internet? Um, and I think that right now, uh, we as countries are talking past each other for different objectives. Um, the Global South really needs an, the internet um, from a development purpose. And we're promising through the development goals if this is going to help lead to um, better education and access to information. It's going to lead to job creation. It's going to lead to a better economic environment for those countries. Um, in Europe, um, we're having a different conversation about, it's about data privacy and um, it's my right to be forgotten and my life should not be surveilled. And in other countries, it's about, I need to have full transparency in what's going on in my country because this is a matter of political stability and my overall sovereign security. So we have to decide when we're talking about governance, what is it that we're trying to govern? Are we trying to reach transparency on the internet? Are we trying to assure uh, privacy on the internet? Are we trying to provide access to everybody for the internet from an innovation perspective? Once we agree upon what it is that we're trying to govern then and come to that kind of a common agreement, I think that we'll be able to advance the conversation in institutions like the United Nations. Now, switching gears slightly, um, we've talked about um, big governance issues, threats to critical infrastructure, but cybersecurity is increasingly an issue that's affecting all of us. 70% of world youth are online. Um, the Internet of Things means that um, in just a few years, many billions of devices, mm. everyday devices will be connected to the internet from your car to your microwave, your pacemaker, That's and right. the, the, the teddy bears in your baby's crib. <laughs> now, the, the internet of things, of course, means also the internet of new things to be hacked yes. with lots of potential vulnerabilities and threats for individuals. What can um, countries do about this? What can companies about do, it, do about this? What can we all do about this? Well, that, that's a really um, great question. And I have a friend uh, here in Tokyo who's coined the Internet of Things in, in two different ways. And, and we, we were together in Washington on a panel. And he calls the Internet of Things should really be called either the Internet of Threats, because we're not doing enough to make them more secure, or we should call it the insecurity of things. <laughs> And, um, and so it's a different way of thinking about the IOT. And um, when you start to talk about as the internet of threats and the insecurity of things, then that means we have something we should do about it. And I think that uh, there's been a conversation about how do we get to uh, security by design products and where we're designing them with well-engineered principles and with few flaws um, and we change the design of these Internet of Things devices from field it fast to f and fix it later to field it right, well engineered, so that it doesn't have to be con fixed every Tuesday. But I think that security by design is not enough as we're starting to have um, Internet embedded devices in our persons as medical devices and we're having Internet embedded devices in every part of our life that we really need to start to think about this as safety by design first. And, um, and that there really must be product liability introduced by countries 
because this is how we think about food, it's how we think about drugs, it's how we think about automobiles, it's these common goods that are part of society. It's about safety and human life, and that's where we're headed for the Internet of Things, that there will be and there is human life involved at this point, and we have to start to think about this, of bringing about responsibility and accountability of those that are fielding these devices, of thinking about safety first, security or resilience second of our of our of all of these things that are embedded into our personal lives into our corporate lives the critical infrastructures and represent the security of our nations terrific final question for me melissa um, which is there are widespread concerns that the u.s and other other governments in the name of counterterrorism are actually um, weakening cybersecurity by pushing for loopholes and by uh, uh, pushing for keeping some weaknesses in the, in, in, in the technology to allow for uh, better surveillance. Do you share that concern? Well, I, I think that when any time a country starts to want to weaken the technology in the name of counterterrorism, in the name of political stability, or wanting to um, have access to the um, the technology in unusual ways or banning technology for certain things, I think it presents a risk. Specifically on encryption, you know, the United States relaxed the export controls on encryption specifically to help enable e-commerce and safe e-commerce. So here we are almost 20 years later and we're talking about a backdoor or weakening encryption. When you weaken it, it's going to be taken and exploited in different ways and so you don't want to weaken the technology and then weaken e-commerce when we're all trying to promote the free flow of goods, data, services and capital across border in a secure way. Um, and so it's dangerous when countries start to say that we need to have access and weaken for in the name of dot 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 we have to actually take the high road and ensure that we can actually preserve the backbone of what has become the global economy and the security and stability of our countries. Terrific. Melissa, thank you so much for your insights. Um, you've managed to make a very complex issue very accessible and uh, make it sound very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Sebastian, thank you.